I'd like to preach to you the statue and the cut rock. The statue and the cut rock. Let's begin, please, with a word of prayer. Father, we just ask that you'll put your hand upon this service tonight. In this sermon, I pray, Lord, that you would let Jesus Christ be magnified in such a humongous way and your sovereignty over time be magnified. And Lord, I thank you for the faith that you, that you have put within us that trusts you and that knows, Lord, that things are not spinning out of control, but they are under your hand. And I ask, oh God, that you would please help us as we look at this big passage here tonight. And Daniel, that you would allow us to see the things that you intended for us to see thousands of years after it was written. And I thank you for your precious word of God and that you knew everything was going to happen. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. As we continue the book of Daniel, turn in your Bibles, please, to Daniel chapter 2 tonight. We will begin to look through some prophecy. And to some of you, that scares you. You're like, oh, no prophecy. I remember that in the mid-70s, actually the late 60s, uh, well, the early 60s, when, when uh, Israel was declared a nation, everybody thought this was the end of the world, and this was great. And, and then uh, the late 60s, prophecy, a lot of prophecy conferences, and mid-70s, and I was born in 70, and then as a young boy, I remember these prophecy conferences. How many of you ever went to any of those prophecy conferences? Yes, yeah, many of you did, and many of you should have. You just stayed home. I don't know, watched TV during that time. Uh, no, there was great view of prophecy, and I remember being a little bit of scared of that, a little bit of bored of that as a young man, and just thinking all oh, these overwhelming thoughts, whatever. Well, it means a whole lot more as uh, we get older, doesn't it? Thinking about the end of time and thinking about God's control and thinking about what is going to happen, how's it's going to play out, and the things that we see in our newspaper and on the news. We begin tonight with some prophecy that this whole book is really about, and it's important to understand this. You know, Daniel is only a few chapters long, you know, only 12 chapters long. It's, it's not long at all. And so when we get into this prophecy, it's going to be just an overwhelming whole boom, 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 and then we're going to be done. We are going to come to the end of chapter 2. Tonight, it's important that we understand that this book is written to reveal God's plan to control the history of kings and kingdoms of the world and ultimately to bring the true king, Jesus. I'm going to say that again, but I'm going to say it in a little bit different way. I'm going to add something to it. The theme of this book and the purpose of this book written for us, for Daniel, for us, is to reveal God's plan to control the history of kings and kingdoms specifically through Gentile domination of the world and ultimately to bring in the true king, Jesus, that would make everything right and turn everything around. Understanding that Israel was ravaged and captive at this time, the book of Daniel is sweet water to a believing Jew who sees the dominance of Gentile powers throughout history and can be assured that Jehovah hasn't lost control. Brother Jeff, he knows the times. He hasn't forgotten persecuted Israel. And there is a king on the way who will wipe out the enemies of God. What is shocking here is Daniel, this young man who is taken captive, who is declaring, who is going to declare all these things tonight. When you think about this, this, the revelation of God that is coming through a young man who is under captivity, and he is saying, Jesus shall rule. Now, you may not care for prophecy. You may find it very confusing. Well, then Daniel is the book for you because it has two tracks, a prophecy track and a very practical track. It's very handy that both of them start with P. What I mean is this big thing happening in the book of God's control over world history through Gentile dominance is something that is played out, is something that is really the thing that's supposed to come across. But then there is this real young man named Daniel that is entangled with all of this and is the mouthpiece of God saying it. He's a real young man who's been taken captive, who probably fought against bitterness and fought against anger and fought against being in a strange country and all of this, but he is making decisions and he is saying things as a godly believer and teaching us how to live as Christians. So there is this prophecy track and this very practical, beautiful track. You remember last week that all the wise men were going to be killed. The king had a dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And uh, the more I look at it, the more I think he didn't remember the dream. You know, that's kind of rough there, knowing if that's really what the deal was or if he was just holding it back. But 
he said, you got to tell me the dream, and you got to tell me the interpretation of the dream, or I'm going to kill you all. And they said, there's nobody in the world, wine, 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 wine. So he says, okay, let's kill them all. They get to Daniel, I don't know at the beginning or the end, they get to Daniel, he says, whoa, 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 and we see how God worked in a great way and worked to grant him time, then God revealed the dream, and we came to that edge right there, that we know that God revealed the, the dream to Daniel. We're going to cover a very large section, a passage today in Daniel chapter 2, and I'm going to ask the help of Pastor Josh, who will come at this time. And uh, you don't worry about him. He's going to sit somewhere beyond me, behind me. I'm going to read the first portion of it. I'm going to let you be seated. And then Pastor Josh is going to read the last portion. And then we're going to preach the word. So we're going to begin with Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse number 26. Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse number 26. This is right at the edge of where we came last week. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded uh, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Here it comes. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Now look up here. I think what he's saying is that, that the, the, way, or the reason the Lord let it be known to me is to spare those wise men so that no more will be killed and so that you could know what your dream meant, all right? Verse 31, thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. The great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. So this is big statue, image. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like a chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art the king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after these, or after thee, all shall arise another kingdom inferior, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear, bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all, thing, all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these things shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. 
Then the king of Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and with sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing that thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. You see here in these verses four divisions. All right, you can think of them this way. If you're taking notes, you'll pick up the verses pretty quickly. First of all, Daniel's introduction into the dream. So he takes several verses to get ramped up before he tells him exactly what the dream meant, means. Secondly, we see the actual dream. We'll see points two and three together. We see the actual dream and the interpretation of the dream. And then fourth, we see how the, the king responds or the joyful, the king's joyful conclusion to the matter. So there's kind of four, think, if you think in outlines, there's kind of four divisions going on here in these verses. First of all, Daniel's introduction into the dream. As Daniel confirms that he, he knows the dream early on, and, and uh, if you turn back to, to verse number 26 or so, as he, as he confirms that he knows the dream, he says some very solid and applicable, applicable things for us to apply to today. This is the practical track. We don't want to skip over it too quick. We want to learn what's here and what he says. I want you to notice, first of all, in verse 28 and 47, that Daniel, or excuse me, that God knows what is going on always and is always in control. Okay, now there's two things that we see there. God knows what's going on always. He knows exactly, I'm going to freak you out a little bit. He knows exactly what's going on here at Lighthouse Baptist Church, and he is very cognizant and thinking about what you're thinking about right now as you hear me preach. He knows everything that is going on always. Everything that's going on in your life always. And the second part of that, he is always in control. So let's see that in verse number 28. He says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Now look at verse 47. It says something similar. The king answered unto, uh, answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a a lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. So what's verse 28 saying? God could reveal this secret because he knows everything. And he knows everything in the future, and he knows what's playing out right now for the rest of time. Look at verse 28 and focus on that last, or next to the last phrase where it says, what shall be in the latter days? Do you see how incredible it is that God here, way back here, way back in the book of Daniel, is telling what is going to happen in the latter days. He even has a mention of what is happening right now in this dream. The Lord knows everything, folks. He always knows what's going on. He's not somewhere in Neverland. He is always thinking about what is going on in humanity. Also, Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar in verse, uh, verse number 37, For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, or 47, excuse me, God doesn't only know what is going on, he is planning it and he's influencing it. Let me back up here because I'm stuttering a little bit. Look at verse 37, not 47, 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. How did Nebuchadnezzar get his kingdom? Because he was a great warrior? Because he beat other kingdoms? Because he invaded lands? No, he had a kingdom because God gave him a kingdom. President Barack Obama is our president because God gave him the United States of America and the leadership of it. And you can say that for every other king. The Lord God doesn't always know about things. He is influencing things. And I don't know his wisdom, and don't you think that you're wiser than him? But he knows everything that's going on, and he's always in control. We need to see in the prophecy of of Daniel, that yes, we influence things by prayer, and yes, things play out even with sin that 
God doesn't condone and things that are awful and things that are horrible. But in the bigger picture, the Lord is in control. And in the big, bigger picture, it may have, be a lot of, you know, the timeline of human history may be a lot like this and going all these places. But in the end, it will land where God wants it. And God doesn't allow it outside of the parameters, but that it will get to the right destination. We will see in the prophecy of Daniel that God chose Gentile kingdoms to dominate history. I wouldn't have done that. How in the world God says, you're my chosen people. You're the apple of my eye, Israel. And then the whole history after that, and he'll say what it's going to be in the future, is dominated by the enemies of God. God allowed that. God knew that. This was God's knowledge and God's choice. This is amazing and shows us that God... And, I, and here's the point for us. That God doesn't need to look like he is in control to really be in control. Let me say that again. Okay, so what we're going to see here is we're going to see the statue. We're going to break it down, literally and figuratively. And we're going to see that through history, Israel, his chosen people, was dominated by enemies and Gentile dominance and Gentile rule. But God was in control all the way. And how does that apply to your life? Sometimes things don't look like they're in control, do they? God doesn't, God doesn't need this facade of being vindicated or to look like he's got everything under control. He really is in control. He doesn't really care what it looks like. He just cares what he's doing. The Gentiles invaded his people... Take, took them captive over time, inhabited their land several times, etc. And in the end, God wins. His people receive the covenant promises, and it was all God's plan, and the king sits on the throne. It plays out exactly how he wants to. Apply the power of what is happening here to how fearful it is getting for believers in this century. Okay, so you got Daniel here, this older young man. He's progressing in age now. He, the ransacked kidnapped, captive Jew as a young man. And he is telling in this chapter uh, that the world is going to be dominated by Gentile, uh, a Gentile king. And that starts with the guy he's talking to, Nebuchadnezzar. But that Jehovah, God knows all and he's in control of all. And eventually he'll bust it all up with his wonderful rock, Jesus Christ. You got this snotty-nosed young man telling this king. And in the end, the king's bowing to the kid. God is in control. Let's glory and apply that to our sin-sick government and the evening news tonight. Hear and be comforted in that phrase in verse 28, what shall be in the latter days, God knows. He's in control of the whole history of mankind, and that is amazing assurance. So much in control that he tells what's going to happen before it happens. And now it's just history book to us as we look back. And any public school can look back at the same thing that we're going to look at tonight. Here it's given us prophecy now it's history. Apply that work of God to your life when things are spinning out of control and the times are not what you think that they should be and you don't know what's going on. God doesn't need to look like he's in control in your life to really be in control. He's in control. Have peace in your heart about that. Many times we cannot feel the control at all. It just feels like you're spinning. It feels like you've been at one of those rides at the amusement park when you get up and you're about ready to, you know? You're just like everything's moving like that. I notice that as I get older in life that that happens like on swings now to me. I don't know what I'm telling you. I can't tolerate anything anymore. Doesn't that feel how life is like sometimes? Like, like whatever. If you stop and think for a moment, you think, who put me in control of this house? Who can be, put me in control of this checkbook? Who put me in this job? I'm so, what, things are out of control. Help me. Well, there's a God who's in control. He really, really is, even when it doesn't look like it. Application number two. Look at verse number 30, please, if you would. It says, but, but as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes. And he goes on. Do you see the humility of Daniel? He took the time before he explained the dream to say, I'm nothing special, king. He put the finger on the glory of God the whole way through this. You know, any gift, talent, ministry, influence, advantage, 
that you have in life has been given to you by God, not yourself. It's been given to you by God for the benefit of others and the service of the Lord, like the end of the verse says. It's been given to you for others, not to prop yourself up. So that means there's no room for personal pride. You don't have anything but what you've been given. There's no room for a lording spirit over other people because you're better. There's no room for judgmentalness of others. A judgmental spirit that looks down on other people. If, we've all been, if we're all poppers and we've all start, started on even ground and whatever we have has been given to us by the Lord, every talent, every advantage, we have nothing to glory in. There's no room for thinking that others are less than you. It is all that you have is from the Lord. I encourage you to let that sink in a moment, what Daniel's saying in verse number 30. Here Daniel's just, he's just excelling, excelling, excelling over everyone else. I mean, nobody can answer anything, and here's Daniel. Hey, I got it. I got it. The Lord has told me. I got, he's, you know, he's over and over in this book just being rising to the top, rising to the top, rising to the top. And yet he is so humble uh, to know and to say to this king, I don't, you know, in this, in this situation, any other person would have tried to get the advantage. Any other person would have taken anything that he could get from the king except Daniel. Daniel humbles. He says, I am nothing, I have nothing but what I've been given of the Lord. I am nothing different than, I'm no one different than any other person, living thing. Let that principle of being a pauper that has only been given things to control the outlook of your life. I'm just a pauper. Anything that I have is of any advantage. If I'm prettier than other people, if I am taller than other people, if I am better looking, if I am whatever, if I have more money, if I have a better job, if I have more possessions, if I've been given better ministry influence, if I have a position, you know, if I have this, if, 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 I'm only a pauper that's been loaned these things. They're not mine. I didn't, it's, I don't have them because of me. It's really what you need to get, like Daniel. That will serve you well as it did for Daniel. Points two and three here in our, in our outline. So we move, progress. Now what about the actual dream and its interpretation? Okay, that's in verse 31 through verse 45. I won't read, read it, but you, you can scan as I preach it to you. He dreamed of a great statue. All right, guys, show them the great statue. That's not exactly a photograph, but it's real close, all right, to what he dreamed there. All right, he dreamed, dreamed of a great statue that you see on the slide. You see that the body parts, it's repeated kind of twice here in our, in, our, in our verses we read. The body parts were made of different metals. The quality and the strengths of the metals probably coincide with what you would go back and look at history about the kingdoms in some way. Okay, we're not going to get bogged down by those details. Also, the actual body parts of what is goal or what is a head and, and the arms or whatever, they seem also to coincide with the empires. They're like that. For instance, I'll just point out one, the Medo-Persians being, you know, the, the chest and the two arms, you know, Medo, Medes, Persians. That kind of coincides too. Now understand that there is no question, sometimes when we come to prophecy, you have scholars, you have pastors that have studied these things a great way and say, I believe this to be this. This is not like this at all. This is history, all right? What is being played out will be repeated in the chapters coming. And these emp- what I'm saying is nobody is guessing at these empires. This is really uh, very clearly what these things mean, what this statue means. Sometimes in prophecy uh, conferences and things like that, someone will say, Walver, someone will say, you know, that, that I believe this is what this means or whatever. That is not what this is. What you see up here in the screen is now history. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The history of controlling kingdoms from about 600 B.C. to several hundred years after Christ. God has given it as prophecy, as I've said, but it is going to repeat, be repeated in the next chapter And now you take a history book and you open it and you can see the dominance of these kingdoms. Gold. Babylonian Empire. That was present, present day in Daniel. This is Nebuchadnezzar, you know, who is the king of it. And he's talking to him. Silver. The Medo-Persian Empire. Bronze. The Greek Empire. Iron. The Roman Empire. The, The feet, part of iron and clay. 
more modern times, more modern divided powers that many very strong powers that can't mingle together, that are, that are against each other, that are now at the end of the world. That could refer to many powers that were after the time of Christ, you know, and even in modern days or fairly modern days, Axis and allied powers and, and, and things in between, divided Western powers. You can refer to the United States. It's probably included in that idea, these broken up superpowers. Now, there is some detail in the phrases in the last part of chapter 2 that we're not going to handle, but I want to refer you to a good book or something that you can work through some of them. There's a detailed book called Things to Come by Pentecost. If you're a reader of prophecy, that is a great book, and I would encourage you towards that, and we can encourage you towards other books. But this statue here is a view of world history that is dominated by great kings and kingdoms that thought that they would never fall. You know, there will be a time where America and China and North Korea and Russia will be nothing. Don't get stuck. These guys were all stuck. Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was great and he would never fall. But there's a wonderful thing in the dream that's a prophecy for us concerning this statue and concerning the times in history as they work down from the head to the feet. It's in in verse 34 and 35. Let's read it, please. It says, thou sawest till that a stone, okay, so, so you got this statue, but then all of a sudden something happens. Nebuchadnezzar in his dream, he's staring at the statue. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. That was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like chaff of the the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Imagine old Nebuchadnezzar dreaming away, snoring away, sawing logs. He's dreaming about this amazing statue. And then he saw a giant stone flinging through the air. And, he, and it nails the statue in its feet of iron and clay. And the whole thing crumbles and breaks apart like chaff into powder. Someday, folks, soon and very soon, that wonderful stone will fling, as it were, from nowhere... The stone not made with men's hands, who was born of a virgin, cut out of the Godhead, not by men's hands, who will return to take down all the kingdoms of the earth. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. You are looking in chapter 2 at extremely practical prophecy. That's exactly the kind of prophecy that it's good to see. He was cut out of the mountain of the Godhead outside of men's invention, the the chief cornerstone, the rock of stumbling offense to some, the rock of salvation to others. He'll come hurling through the air and catch the modern kingdoms of the world with such force and such surprise that they will tumble into a heap of history. That glorious rock will arrive with such great force in his second coming that he will immediately become a great mountain a much greater king and a much greater kingdom than the whole statue of the world, than the statue of the dream, that rock that hits him at his feet becomes a great mountain. It's the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please read verse 44 with joy, with reality, with expectation that this is about to happen. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It's not going to be men that establish Jesus' kingdom, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now that's a kingdom. That's an empire. Let me rush you to the scene as it is recorded in the book of of Revelation by prophetic eyewitness. Let me rush you to the scene of how that's going to happen. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. 
And he was clothed. I hear some of you turning pages. It's Revelation 11. I'm at about verse number 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. I do believe that is us. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress and the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the rock that flings through the air that knocks down all the empires in the end. That is the rock that becomes a mountain. That is the kingdom that never fails in the end. Folks, kingdoms have come and gone on this earth. Huge kingdoms and dominating Gentile kingdoms. Powerful kings who names are leaders on all the medals of the statues that I didn't name. And even many, many great kings and leaders that are in history books that we could name. But there is coming a king that outshines and outlasts them all. He is really coming, and his kingdom will have no comparison. And you will be in his kingdom. And it will be a real kingdom. And you will see it with your eyeballs. And it will be real. And there will be no more, no more sin that will be allowed to rule. And there will be no more injustice because he'll rule with judgment and equity and righteousness as we saw this morning what a kingdom what a king he will rule bodily forever and ever a thousand years first on this sin torn earth and then putting all enemies down forever and ever the perfect new Jerusalem this is the kingdom that we're waiting for this is why we get up tomorrow morning with great hope Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. Behold the islands with their kings and Europe her best tribute brings. From north to south the princes meet to pay their homage at his feet. You know, that's very biblical. We're going to sing that song it's our invitation song. It's very biblical. The Bible says that the kings of the world will bring their glory to him. I don't know exactly what that means. But every kingdom will bow to him. Every king. Finally tonight, let's see the king's joyful conclusion. It's in verse 46 through 49. It says this, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshipped Daniel. Now, don't you worry about that for Daniel's sake. He was a slave. He had to just stand there. And commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. And the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth, that your God is a God of gods. Old Nebuchadnezzar had not quite come to Jehovah yet as, as Lord and Savior. He was getting there. And a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. The king made Daniel a great man, gave him many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested the king. He set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. I just want to quickly point out a few things, and we're done tonight. First, we need to learn from this that Daniel humbled himself and submitted to being used of God with great courage. And when he did that, when he was bold, God begins turning the king's heart and turning many in the kingdom towards Jehovah. How, what a crazy thing that salvation is. I mean, they're the, they're the captives. The captive, the slaves, are bringing the captors to the power and the control of Jehovah God. What a crazy turnaround thing this is. But who can explain salvation and the power of it there's a lady this morning came with a great broken heart for her sin placed her faith in the lord jesus christ at the end of our service who can explain the power and the working of salvation jehovah's name is exalted by daniel being bold and courageous standing up for the lord jehovah's name is exalted when we as his servants are willing to be used by him courageously this time 
folks, in our history, especially in the United States of America, is no time to hide. There's no bunker that we need to find. This church is not our bunker. We need to be on the offensive. We win. Our king is coming, flying through the air, a great rock coming, a great stone. He is the powerful kingdom. We don't hide in the bunker and complain and fear. We, like Daniel, step out to be used of the Lord. We need to be loving but bold to our friends and in the workplace, taking stands for what is right, but even greater than that, telling about the stone coming, telling about Jesus. Drawing men to salvation, telling them about the cross and the resurrection, the true king. Folks get a vision of the, the giant rock of Jesus flying through the air and destroying all his foes. He is going to win. Be confident and joyful about God's hand on history right now and be a part of it. The evening news should make you turn it off with a scowl just teeing up the ball. The great cut stone It's going to fly through the air. You need to be verbal and lovingly courageous and God will get the glory from you the same as he got from Daniel here. You may be able to influence many people by your bold and courageous testimony. God uses this to move Daniel to even a more influential place as a great ruler. He's able to influence Daniel in future passages, in Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, in future passages, in the whole kingdom in a much greater way. The Lord may use you that way. He's even, Daniel's able to speak the gospel. He is speaking the gospel when he's talking about this rock that is coming. He is telling about Christ. He's speaking about the great king, Christ. I don't want to take our mind off of the great stone of Jesus Christ tonight, but I want to show you one more very practical living thing, the practical track that this chapter ends with in verse number 49. When Daniel was exalted, he doesn't forget his friends. And I know this, this is really a minor point when you think about the great stone of Jesus Christ, but he doesn't forget his friends. And the Lord puts verse 49 for our practical knowledge. You know, you would think that he would get puffed up and prideful. He's exalted to this high position. <clears throat> but he is still humble, and he asked the king that his buddies would be exalted with him. Folks, do you know tonight that the second great commandment is that we should love others as ourselves? Do you know it is our joy as born-again believers to encourage others, to edify others, to lift others up, and want to see others succeed? It was 1 Corinthians 13, that great passage of charity, that says that love seeketh not her own. It's not just, not just wanting yourself to be exalted. You know, it's Daniel wanted others to be exalted. That great passage, 1 Corinthians 13, also says that love hopeth all things. It wants, its, wants the best for others. That's selfless love. So I don't know how you need to apply that about remembering others when the Lord allows you to be exalted. But this is a, a true show that Jesus Christ is in you. I need to work on this. And I, I think that probably all of us do. As you think of this big world tonight, the history of mankind, the future before us, if you and I will keep our confidence on the eyes, and our eyes on the heavenly cut rock Jesus that is coming, we will not be overwhelmed in this time period, in this really small time period, by fear and confusion, we will be confident and stand for what is biblical and right by God's words. We will want to bring others to stand on the rock and not be crushed by the rock. Tomorrow you enter another day in the human experience. I want to encourage you that you enter it looking for the rock that is flying and coming from nowhere set all the wrongs right, and to establish a kingdom that is forever. Our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you take your hymn book and turn to hymn number 250?